There are a lot of talented people in West Tennessee, and McNary County wants the world to know it. Arts in McNary, AIM, has inaugurated the Artisan Trail. This biannual event is a 10-stop tour of the county, which highlights the heritage and beauty of West Tennessee. Well, we have eight artisan stops, and then we have some extra stops which have historical interests, like the McNary County Museum, and we have Big Hill Pond State Park, and the other artists, well, they're spread pretty far around the county. We have, um, we don't have any right in Selmer, but we have one right in Adamsville, which is our major towns, but most of them are out in the country, and it spreads throughout the county. Joanna and her husband were the inspiration for the trail event. We hope to give McNary County the reputation of an artist community so we bring more artists in and more people so that the trail will be a year-round thing so that people will come to the county for artists, crafts and things, not only during the trail dates but all year round. The trailhead is Bethel Springs Community Center. Maps and information are available here and several artisans share their work. I was in the Air Force for 28 years. I retired as a full colonel. And when I retired, I wanted to do something uh, more creative and something that I enjoyed doing, and I've always enjoyed carving. And so I started doing the different carvings, uh, gun stocks, different things, and to me it's just a, it's an expression of who I am. I like carving nature. Uh, I like leaving as much of the original material in the item as possible because I think nature is the most beautiful thing in the world. So I like carving you know, leaves, uh, feathers, uh, birds. I like carving more natural things as much as possible in, in my work. Uh, I take real leaves from my yard and I use those as the template by which I carve my jewelry um, because the ones in the books don't look like, I don't think those guys have ever seen a real leaf in their life. I like to see a real leaf and that's what I like to carve. One of the unique features of Mike's work is that he uses woolly mammoth ivory. I get my uh, ivory imported from Russia. Most of it comes from Siberia. I do get some from Alaska. Uh, the internet's a great source for it. It's, uh, it's expensive, but it's a beautiful material to work with. There is a finite supply of mammoth ivory in the world. They're not making any more. <laughs> They've been extinct for over 4,000 years, and that's why that's the only ivory I'll use. I can buy elephant ivory, but I won't use it. It's not right. Vicki Cisco Cohen is affectionately called the Clay Lady. Her pottery bears her artistic flair. I actually got started in college at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. I was a double major in creative writing and art and decided I liked the art and started in the clay and just fell in love. Um, as a child, I always liked to mess around with sculpture and making stuff out of dirt and mud. And so I guess that followed me into my adult years. Probably my favorites are the more sculptural pieces, but um, it just seems like the functional pieces do better. People like things they can use, and I like the fact that there's the tactile experience of the hands-on. You've made a piece, and then other people are using the same piece, so it's from hand to hand. With map in hand, we head for the trail. We have limited time and battery power, so we chose three stops for this visit. This is Happy. Happy's the thief. He steals the <laughs> other one's food most of the time. Welcome to Beulah Land Alpaca Farm. These exotic animals come from the Andes Mountains in South America, and their fleece comes in 22 different shades of black, white, and brown. It is the second rarest luxury fiber in the world. Uh, up until recent times, you mostly, if you wanted an alpaca product, would find it at Neiman Marcus or a store like that, a high-end department store. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, four times warmer than wool, and it's softer and superior to cashmere. So it's a really extraordinary uh, product, and it is rare, so you don't see it very much. Diane and her husband began with four alpacas. Now they have eight. I love them. They don't have upper teeth, you know, so they don't have any self-defense. They can run like the wind and spit at you, but that, that's about it. And they're gentle and precious. They are very hardy. They've had no health problems since we've had them. I mean, you have to clip their little toenails and, um, because they don't have a hoof, and you have to uh, give them a shot once a month for parasites. So that's really the care they need. They eat hay and grass, 
And then in the morning and evening, we give them a supplementary grain, which is a very small quantity. Really, it's just a nutritional supplement. The fleece is amazingly soft and makes luxurious teddy bears, sweaters, hats, scarves, and other clothing. We did a show in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, Celebration Village, which is a big show for raising money for a hospice. And uh, for some reason, only the Lord knows why, we were chosen to speak on the Fox local news channel about our product and the alpaca socks have taken off <laughs> like wildfire selling. They're really, really good because they're real silky and warm and your feet don't sweat in them. Plus, they're being four times warmer than wool. I mean, these socks are very desirable, especially for guys that are outdoors a lot. Another stop takes us to Finger and the home studio of Tim Pace. Tim has an eye for scrap metal and his creations range from delicate to whimsical. They're simple in concept, but technical in how I, I try to put them together. So, so almost every single piece, when you look at them, you should be able to see both sides, the, the material used and the finished concept. And so that, that's my challenge every, every piece, is kind of trying to keep that so that I could take a torch and, and do, do some pieces a whole lot faster by just fabricating things out. That's not really what I do. Um, I, like, I like to use found objects in there and, and, and as close to the state that they were in so that you can recognize both sides. It began in 95. I made a gift for my stepdad for Father's Day. Uh, did it during lunch breaks. Uh, I made a golfer. And the golfer was about a little, about three foot tall golfer, all out of just some junk pieces laying around and a welder that I had given to me, or actually I was storing this welder, it wasn't even mine, I was I, I'm still storing it. Uh, not knowing what to do with it, you know, I, I have no welding training, I have no art training, uh, just trying to come up with a clever gift for my stepdad. Uh, my boss saw it and he says, hey, I want one of those. And then his boss said, hey, I want one of those. And next thing you know, I was making golfers. Uh, and it kind of snowballed into this, doing this full time. Now, two years after that, I quit my job. I was an electrician. I did industrial troubleshooting. Uh, I quit that to do this full time. Every piece is an original and is signed and numbered. Where does Tim get his inspiration? It comes from the piles of scrap metal. Uh, they literally kind of dictate what they are going to be. I don't keep uh, finished pieces in the shop. I don't, I do have a wish list that customers will ask for a piece or something and if I find something that's close, you know, but most of the time it's, it's, oh, those two pieces laying there are the legs for this and that and I saw and I find a body for it, find a head for it and I have a finished piece. His favorite piece is also his largest, the praying mantis in downtown Jackson. That is 16 foot 10 inches tall. He's all made from recycled, like a kid's slide and some pipe that I got off of a farm, a uh, tractor seat for his head. It's painted John Deere green. He's reading a book. Uh, he's got little reading glasses. Um, he's a fun, big piece. Our stop in Adamsville is a celebration of frontier heritage and a craft carefully preserved by Constance Beck. Well, spinning probably started thousands of years ago with the drop spindle. I always say probably somebody was actually just twisting their hair and they realized that they could get something stronger and so then they you know went from there into fibers. But anything that is fiber-like can be spun into a, a yarn or a material to, to weave with. Um, right now this one is wool. I also raise goats so I do a lot with mohair from Angora goats, um, alpaca, llama, um, any kind of fiber. Uh, soy fiber now is, is one that we're using. Um, of course, cotton. So it all just has to be um, washed, combed, and then after that you can just spin it into yarn that you can use. Well, th what the wheel does is it turns and it makes a twist. And so it, you can see the twist here. So my job as a spinner is to decide how thick I want my yarn to be. and to bring the twist down into the other piece. So as my hand moves, it's holding off the twist 
When I let go, it brings the twist down into the other part of the fiber. If I didn't block it off with my hands, it, all the twists would go into the big piece and I have a knot. Spinning is something you can learn in three to four or five hours, but it's the practice of working with your fiber that determines that you'll have a uniform yarn. Appalachian Threads is a fun mix of color, history, and materials. Visiting from Savannah on this day was Laura Rushing. Her baskets and chairs are works of art. I do as ma many chairs as I do baskets. Just, <laughs> it seems that way anyway. A lot of people are going back to their old chairs and wanting to re -bought them. And uh, so it's a, it seems like it's a going thing more now than, than it has been. But I started out with baskets. I started out in 1989 was when my mother and my aunt was doing this and they wanted to teach me so I, I picked it up at that time. And it was just a hobby for many years and then it seems like this last year though it has just kind of blossomed for me and so uh, I'm just doing more and more. I do the first row, uh, one under and three over three over, uh, three under, and three over, and three under, and three over, all the way across. And then I turn my chair over, and I do the same thing on the back, on the bottom. And it, the bottom will look the same as the top when I get through. Laura uses the inner lining of a special cane to weave these chair seats. On average, it takes seven to eight hours to complete a chair. You can weave too tight, or you can weave too loose. And it's, it's hard to really get it just right. But if you'll give a little cushion, it will last much longer. Our trip along the Artisan Trail in McNary County was fascinating and fun. We look forward to another trip to see the places we missed this time around. My whole thing is to try to keep the heritage arts and crafts alive. So uh, I teach spinning and weaving classes, and you know, my thing is, Hopefully the next generation will want to do this. I don't want to see it die. <laughs>